Hello, welcome to our today tutorial and uh, I'm going to look at uh, design of continuous one-way spanning slab and before we start I request you to like, share and comment on my YouTube channel so as we can improve our work. So this is the slab arrangement. Now uh, we have uh, what you call a slab panel. We have panel one, panel two up to panel seven and each panel has a dimension of 7,425 millimeter by 3,225 millimeter. So from our previous um, um, tutorial, we said this the longest side is LY and the shortest side is LX. So keep in mind this particular dimension because we'll use them to prove that this is a one-way spanning slab. Now, as we proceed, we will look at um, some aspects. Now, first thing we can look at cover to reinforcement. So, what determine the uh, the amount of cover to be to be allowed on the steel reinforcement? So condition number one is durability requirement. Like, where is this structure? Is it exposed? Is it in a chemical plant? Is it an inside slab or uh, whatever? So that we call it durability. So which comes in hand with the exposure condition. For now, for you to get the guidance on that, you go to BS 8110, uh, uh, table 3.3. Then also you can also consider for fire requirement, like after exposure to fire, for how long, how many hours should this structure withstand the exposure to fire? We now that can be found in table 3.4. It will guide you if you provide this particular cover, then it can withstand fire for this particular number of hours. Now, for our case here, we'll assume a cover of 25 millimeter. This cover will be able to withstand mild exposure conditions in terms of where the slab is used and it can withstand up to two hours of fire. When the building exposed to fire, we, uh, until two hours of constant exposure, then the failure will not occur. So let's select a cover of 25 millimeter. Now, another thing, let's go to slab load evaluation or design loading. Now, first of all, we have to assume the thickness of the slab, and we said that thickness is given by H. Now, we know that dead weight, this um, weight or the uh, which we uh, does not change throughout the entire lifetime of the structure. For example, the weight of the slab itself and the finish, they are dead. They cannot change in terms of size and direction of, of um, action. So self-weight of the slab, we said, is given by thickness of slab H multiplied by the density of concrete. We know that density of concrete is 24 kilonewton per cubic meter. Now we change the thickness of the slab into meter, which comes to 0 0.125. You multiply by 24 days of concrete, you get three kilonewton per square meter. And then finishes mostly will be given, or you can assume that the finishes will be equivalent to one kilonewton per square meter. So these are dead loads. So when we sum up, we get the total dead load, which is given by GK as three plus one, four kilonewton per square meter. Then impost load. Impost load is uh, derived from the BS code 6399 part one. Now this particular value of impost load, impost load is same as live load, is based on the intended use of the structure. You find like, for the case of an office, the impost load might be lower compared to a dining hall or a dormitory for students because you know students are full of excitement and that particular load, live load, that changing load might be higher compared to an office where someone just go sit and do his daily routine work. So impost load comes in based on the intended use of that particular structure. For our case here, let's assume we have an impost load of three kilonewton per square meter. Now, from there, we can go to design load. Design load is given by 1.4 dead load plus 
1.6 imposed or live load, which means 1.4 times 4 plus 1.6 times 3, it will give us a design load of 10.4 kilonewton per square meter. Now, from what I showed you on the first diagram, we say that LY is the longest dimension of the slab. It was 7,425 millimeter and our LX, the shortest span was 3,225 millimeter. So if we divide LY over LX, we, this ratio will help us to know whether it is one way or two way. And if the ratio is above two, then it is one way. If the ratio is less than two, it is a two way spanning. So for our case here is 74, 25 divided by 32, 25 you get 2.3, which is more than two. So this can make us more confident and say, for sure, the slab panel is one way, spanning slab. Now let's proceed. Now for the case of continuous, this is a continuous slab. The design is very easy and different from simply supported slab. Now, according to table 3.12 of BS 8110, the maximum sagging moment is that the middle of the end span and maximum support moment is that the first interior support. And in this case, their value is 0 0.086 uh, design load times uh, length. Now, let me show you the table 3.12. Now, when we come here, this is table 3.12. Now, what we look at, this is, we, we have, we have, in a way, one way, our slab is one way spanning this table, 3.12 of BS8110. So the value of moment we have at the outer support is zero, and near middle is 0 0.086, and then interior support is negative 0 0.063. Design load multiplied by length. Now, the, what you have to consider, when you come to this table of the moment, you pick the highest value. So among us, all the value you find, we have two value, 0 0.086 FL and negative 0 0.086 FL. So this it doesn't matter. We pick the highest value. We, we don't consider the sign. So you find that the highest moment will occur near the middle of the end span and at the first interior support. That is why here we have a value of 0 0.086. So we pick a value of 0 0.086 FL. For the case of slab, we design, we consider a one meter wide strip. So the value of B or width is one meter. Now we will come and say, now our force here, force will be equivalent to, Design load 10.4 kilonewton per square meter, we multiply by the hour span. Now, remember for one way span slab, you take the LX, the value of the shorter span is the hour slab span. So it will be 10.4 times 32.25 millimeter, which is 3.225 millimeter. You get 33.54 kilonewton per meter because we want to consider one meter strip. Now from there, from the table 3.12 shown in our maximum moment, irrespective of the other one was a negative moment and uh, the other one is positive moment, we only consider the value. Now the maximum moment that, that this particular slab will be subjected to is 0 0.086 FL, so 0 0.086. Our F, we've got it 33.54. And our L is the span, which is 3.225. You get it's 9.3 kilonewton meter per meter. Remember, if, if you multiply this value, this value by L, it will give you kilonewton. But now we the reason why we have kilonewton meter per meter now this meter will cancel this meter and just be kilonewton. But now because it's a moment, moment is given in values of kilonewton meter or uh, the value of force and distance. So kilonewton meter per meter. Another assumption we'll make now, let's assume, and what I can tell you in most practical nowadays, the minimum bar diameter for a slab should be 10 millimeter diameter. Some will use Y10, some will use uh, T10, but uh, 
the mean the same or d10 is the same thing provided just show the diameter of the steel you are using now we need to calculate what you call the effective depth d the effective depth is equivalent to thickness of the slab h minus covered reinforcement c minus diameter of the reinforcement bar divided by Two. So this is 125 minus cover 25 minus 10 diameter over 2, you get 95 millimeter. Then we compute K. K is equivalent to M over MCU BD squared. MCU, the strength of concrete, characteristic strength of concrete. B is 1 meter. We said for a slab, we fix it to 1 meter width. So it will be 1 meter. And then D, we have it. So if we substitute, 9.30 times this 10 power 6 is to convert 10 power 3 to convert kilonewton to newton and another 10 power 3 is to convert meter to millimeter making it a total of 10 power 6 so you divide by 30 times b b is 1 meter now we need to have uniformity of unit you convert it to millimeter times 95 squared so you find it is 0 0.034 now, the limiting value is 0 0.156. If this value is more than 0 0.156, it means we have to design the slab as a doubly reinforced. But in most or all the slab, the value of K will always be less than 0 0.156, and they are designed as singly reinforced. Then we have another component compute. We call it the arm z now this arm z is computed using two formulas one formula is 0 0.5 plus square root of 0 0.25 minus k over 0 0.9 d or just 0 0.95 d so if you compute this value and you find it is more than 0 0.95 d you disregard it and say z is equivalent to 0 0.95 d for example here if we can substitute z 0. 5 plus square root of that 0 0.25 0 0.034 over 0 0.9 you get it is 0 0.96 d like i told you now because it's 0 0.96 d we disregard it and only use our z as 0 0.95 d because the maximum value of z should be 0 0.95 d so if you calculate and find it is becoming more than 0 0.95 d then you cancel it and use a value of 0 0.95 d now we move and calculate the area of reinforcement now the area of reinforcement required as required is equivalent to the design moment divided by 0.87 fyz the same way i said this 10 power 6 is to convert this into newton millimeter moment into newton millimeter per meter and then 0 0.87 times 460 the strength of steel multiplied by z is 0 0.95 d so this one is z 0 0.95 times 95 is just z so you get it is 2 158 millimeter squared per meter. Remember, for the case of slab, we consider per meter width. Now, from there, we have before we go to obtain this area from the table, we have to check does it mean the minimum steel area required? So, the minimum steel area we said AS minimum is equivalent to 0.13 percent B h so which is the same as uh, now it's like now we have taken this bh can come here and then this 100 comes down here meaning like because 0 0.13 is a percent when you see something a percent it means it's divided by 100 so someone can also write it as this way 100 as mean over bh should be at least equivalent to 0 0.13. So if we compute this, you find, if you compute, you find it is 163 millimeter square per meter. So our area is 258 and the minimum allowed is 163, meaning it is okay. So we can now go to the table and find the number of bars and spacing, which will give an area equal to 258 or slightly more than 258 but we must consider a diameter of 10 millimeter bar diameter so uh, let me demonstrate this is 258 so i'll come here 
258. These are still area. So, and it reinforcement by area millimeter square per meter width for various bus spacing. So our area was 258 and uh, now our 258 and we have to consider now this is bar diameter, this is a bus spacing. And what is inside here is the area. So remember we said we look for an area equal or more than 258 and then it might add along a diameter of 10 millimeter. So I can say 10, I can start moving here. This is way too big. I move, this is way too big, this is too big. This is um, um, way too big, this too big. We have this one here, we have this and this. So uh, the value of 262, 286, and 314 can be accepted. But now we have another check that specify the maximum spacing of this particular bar. So for a case of our question, we'll take a value of 314 millimeters squared per meter. Now, when you take 314 millimeters square per meter, it means you provide T10 bar, T10, at 250 center to center. So this is what we have. We said provide T10, so diameter of 10, this is twisted bar, diameter of 10 at 250 millimeter, center to center. Now we say area provided is 314 millimeter squared per meter. So area required is what you calculate, but area provided is what we've read from the table. Now let's check for maximum spacing. That is what I was telling you. However much you provide your bus, but put in mind that there is a limitation for spacing. This, this distance here, center to center, it has some limitation, it has some rule which must be respected. Now, maximum spacing should be less of either three times effective depth or 750 millimeters. So that value, that value spacing between the center of bus should, should be the lesser of these two particular value. And now 3D is equivalent to three times 95, 285 millimeter. Now, because now 285 millimeter is the lesser because 750 millimeter is the higher. So now we say the, the maximum spacing should be limited to 285 millimeters. But when you come to this particular table, you find that we have no spacing of 200 and 285. So meaning, uh, meaning that our spacing should be 275 going downward. That's why we opted to take our bus to provide them at 250 millimeter center to center. So because we meet the maximum spacing, then we say the spacing of 250 millimeter is satisfactory. Then we have what you call the distribution steel. Now the steel you provided, we call it B1. B1, it means bottom one, they'll be at the bottom to form the first layer. Now we have what you call distribution steel. Distribution steel are put in a transverse, transverse direction. Let me try. So if we have these, so if this is our slab, we can have this still here as the bottom one. These are, we can call them the main steel. And then we'll have steel on top of them, which we call the transverse or distribution bus. Distribution bus. So these are 
the distribution bar. So the first one were the B1 main bar. Then the these were the B1. What was the B1? Yeah, the first one to draw was maybe say B1, and this one will be will be B2, bottom two. Now for you to provide the distribution still, distribution still must must certify the minimum area of reinforcement. As we had calculated above, we said the minimum area was 0.13% BH, which is 163 millimeter squared per meter. Now, we also, as we also go to check for this particular 163, remember you must provide bus with a maximum spacing less than three times effective depth or 700 and 50 millimeter, whichever is lesser. Now, now since 163, since we are limited by 285, still we'll pick a spacing of 250 millimeter. This one here, still we'll uh, pick a spacing of uh, 314 at 250, 250 millimeters. Because this spacing here, you see it is, uh, 275, which is acceptable. If, if someone chooses 275, spacing is still correct. But for us, you wanted to have now um same spacing for a bar. That is why we picked a one value. But there is no wrong in choosing uh, 275, which is um, T10 at 275 center center, provided it meet the criteria for maximum allowable spacing. Now, now we'll provide T10 at 250 center to center as the bottom to us transverse. Transverse bar, or we call them distribution bar. Their work is to help in controlling the cracking. Then we can go to deflection. You find that for you to compute deflection, sorry, <clears throat> you have to have the span, which is 325 millimeter. Now for a continuous lab panel, we know that from table 3.9 of BS8110, that basic span of effective depth is given by 26. That is for a continuous lab panel. And then now we can go ahead and see our actual deflection will be span, which is 3,225 divided by effective depth. We calculated at 95 millimeter. You get 33.94. Then we go to permissible or allowable. will be given by, now we calculate the surface stress, which is given by 2 over 3. Fy times area required over area provided times one over beta. But beta, we assume it to be one. So this particular one over beta, we normally ignore it. And remember, area required is what you calculate and area provided is what you read from the table. So these particular formulas are here. Just want to show you, I forgot to reference them, but uh, I can take uh, the shortest time possible to show you how we are getting them. Now this is the, now we have to calculate the surface stress and the modification factor. So we'll come and say like our surface, surface stress is given by two Fy, AS required over 3AS area provided times 1 over beta. But this part here, 1 over beta is simply equivalent to 1. So we'll ignore it. So we'll come and substitute. Remember our area, 2 over 3. Our still strength is 460. Then our area required was 258 what we calculated as the main area divided by the area provided what we read from the table was 314 we multiply by 
one over one. This is significant because this is technically one. So you don't have to write one over one. This is just enough up to this point. You get 250, two Newton per millimeter squared. Now from there, we can also compute another component, m, m over bd squared, which is 9.3 times 10 power 6 to convert. Then b is 1,000 times d squared. How are we, why are we doing this? Is because now when you come here, this is table 3.10 of BS8110, you find our formula modification factor is 0 0.55 plus 477, this is just a fixed minus surface stress divided by 120 into 0.9. So this we are calculating this component here to make our work easier. And remember the modification factor should be less than Two. Wherever it is more than two, only take a value of two. That is why now we have to compute and get. So if we substitute, you find that uh, modification factor, modification factor, not F1, kindly modification factor is equal to 0 0.55. When we substitute, you find it is 1.52, which is less than two, which is okay because the limiting factor, uh, value is two. Now, from there we can come as in a allowable, you take span over, span over effective, no, allowable is span is basic times uh, the, the ratio. So which will be equivalent to 26, which was basic multiplied by 1.52. There is a sort of confusion here, sorry. You take 26, which is the basic ratio multiplied by 1.52. So you get 39.52. So you find what is allowed, what is permissible is 39.52 and our actual Deflection is 33.9 for meaning our actual is less than what is permissible. Then we say deflection is satisfied because allowable is greater than actual. Actual is less than the, than allowable. Now let's go to shear. Now shear. Now the same way we did to moment for shear, you look at from the table. 3.12, we look at a value of shear that is the highest. Now, when we come here, shear, we have 0 0.4F, 0 0.46F, 0 0.6F, 0 0.5F. So the highest value is 0 0.6F. Now, now uh, you can ask, why are we using the highest value? Now, what I can tell you is you are going to from town A to town B, and for you to get town B, we have four roads. And each route has different kilometers. So you find that if you want to plan well, you will fuel your car with the fuel that is able to cover the longest route, not the shortest route, because you, you always consider the most disadvantaged. So in, in design as well, we consider which member is so critical, which member is likely to fail in case of failure will occur. So if we can satisfy that member, we can uh, if we can ensure that that member is well taken care of, then the failure is eliminated. For, for example, here, the inter first interior support is the one with the highest shear. So if we can design to meet this shear of 0 0.6 F, 0 0.6 design ultimate load, you find that even whichever load, the, the other members, the other support will be able to withstand because the value of shear they are being subjected to is uh, less than what we made them to withstand. That is why in design, we pick the highest value. We picked here 0 0.086, which is the highest, and we are picking here 0 0.6 because that is the members which are likely to fail in case of a failure. So if we can ensure they don't fail, then automatically the other members are likely not to fail. So we'll take now, I will say 0 0.6F, which is 0 0.6 times 33.54. This one we had calculated it earlier on, which is 20.12 kilo Newton. Because this value is 33.54 kilo Newtons.
And then from there, maximum permissible shear. Maximum permissible shear is normally 0 0.8 FCU or 5 newton per millimeter squared. So the, the whatever value of shear you get, it will not exceed the lesser of 0 0.85 FCU or 5 newton per millimeter squared. Now, if we compute our FCU stress of concrete, we said it was 30. 0 0.8 square root of 30, you get 4.38 newton per millimeter squared. Now we go to design shear, shear stress. Now we know that stress is force over area. Force we found it is 20.12 kilonewton. You multiply by 10 power 3 to convert it to newton divided by area here is width which is one meter one thousand millimeter multiplied by d ninety five you get zero point zero point two one newton per millimeter squared now we check against the maximum shear so you find maximum was four point three eight and our design is zero point two one very much below the maximum so you say shear is okay now you find the applied shear is less than the maximum allowable now from now we want to look at the shear strength of concrete which is given by vc now i don't want to confuse you here now for you to compute the shear the shear stress of concrete shear strength which means what the concrete can carry without failure we normally compute we normally use this table here let me show you the table that is you so that next time if you find a question that need require a table you don't become confused now this is uh, this table 3.16 is which guide us and we said that maximum shear should be the less of 0 0.8 fcu or 5 newton per millimeter squared this is the limitation that is table 3.16 this is what what is our guiding principle This is the table now for you to find first of all you have to compute 100 area provided divided by the breadth times the depth and then now you come here and read a value so once you compute this value here maybe you locate assuming it is 0 0.5 and our depth effective depth is uh, 200 millimeter so you will come this way and come this way horizontally and now you will say our concrete strength is 0 0.6 newton per millimeter squared now our case is different because the minimum effective depth taken care in this table is 125 millimeters but when you look at our our minimum but our minimum our effective depth is only 95 millimeter so meaning it is not among the tabulated values so we'll have to calculate it manually so but we know that the, the value the, the formula to calculate the shear strength of concrete is 0 0.79 into 100 as which is area provided divided by breadth times depth power 1 over 3 multiplied by 400 divided by d power 1 over 4 divided by the factor of safety of the steel this uh, sigma m is factor of safety of steel now what you need to know first condition is 100 as over b b d should not should not be greater than three. So we have to fulfill that condition. So we come here and start testing. So this is the formula to compute the shear strength of concrete. This you use the, this formula if the value of your depth does not 
fall under any of the given values. It's not 125, it's not 150, it's not 175, 200, 400. But if you have a value of 125, you use a table. Ours is 95 and you cannot use a table. So the test number one, 100 AS over BD should not be greater than three. So we come at test 100 AS over BD. AS, remember, is uh, still provided, which we read from the table is 0 0.33 less than three, which means it's okay. Condition number two, it says, uh, now that we didn't provide shear reinforcement because we said uh, the shear is uh, less than the maximum, you find that this value here, she will not be taken as less than. Now, this value here should be more than 0 0.67, 400 over D. So we come and compute 400 over D, our D is 95, is equal to 1.43, which is greater than 0 0.67, is okay. Then if fact, partial factor of safety for steel is 1.25. This one here, this value here is 1.25. Now we can substitute and say, now our VC, shear stress or strength of concrete is equivalent to that. We substitute and get 0 0.9, 0 0.66 Newton per millimeter squared. Now that because design shear is less than shear strength of concrete, then shear check is satisfied. Now we have here, FCU, now FCU over 25 power, one over three, this is the table says, the table says here, like for characteristic concrete strength greater than 25 hours was that the value in this table may be multiplied by FC over 25 power a third. That is why we, we use this value here power, power one over three. Thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward for your questions and comment, but please share subscribe and like my channel. Thank you very much.